Well, thanks everyone for hanging on. I won't try and keep you longer than five o'clock or that's actually eclipsed already. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, the role of chemical analysis and particularly uh, its use in geoprospection. Um, I want to sort of uh, refer to some of the work which we are um, doing today and give a, a brief background really to how geochemical analysis has been and can be used in archaeology. We've already seen in Eamon's uh, paper some interesting developments um, in that area. In light of us um, celebrating 50 years of uh, prospection, it's probably worth just having a little sort of uh, look backwards to start off with. Um, and again, uh, just sort of taking note of Eamon's uh, points, it's interesting to note in some ways um, the development of geochemistry, particularly soil chemistry and archaeology, has gone full circle. Um, it's a very distinct development in comparison to geophysics, and its early use was very much aligned with trying to understand the soil system itself, particularly the role of chemistry in pedogenesis, and critically in terms of how nutrients were sort of uh, became available uh, for agriculture. So, in, in, in that light, it very much is alloyed, uh, allied rather to agronomy and uh, understanding how soil acts as a sort of substrate for uh, food production. Later on, um, by about the sort of 1950s, 60s, we see a distinct shift in soil chemistry um, away from looking at uh, iron exchange in um, explicitly agricultural applications and more towards a concern with contamination and pollution studies. So soil chemistry tends to be rehoused um, within an environmental soil science uh, domain. But of course, you know, more recently, these things have very much uh, merged together. And in some ways, looking at um, archaeological geochemical or soil chemical signatures, uh, again, sits between the two, and it echoes much of what uh, Eamon was referring to um, earlier. Um, the sort of um, that this role between um, agricultural interests and uh, archaeological sites is, is very you know, well established. Um, certainly by the start of the 20th century, by sort of, uh, 1910 around then, um, it's been noted in the review of the British Agriculture and Hydraulic Policy in Egypt that uh, in addition to the benefits which the annual Nile flood brings, um, the fertility of historic habitations were also noted. Um, it wasn't as if farmers were digging these up to replant them to take advantage of the enhanced pea, but soil crops were noted as growing better on um, historic habitations. That was always put down to enhanced phosphorus. Um, the real development of uh, soil chemistry in terms of archaeology, we have to look to Sweden and uh, the work of Irenaeus in the 1920s who uh, really interestingly noted the elevation of phosphorus around uh, uh, ancient villages and particularly church sites. And he developed a really interesting approach where he was using a spatial grid to uh, plot the presence of phosphorus and to align this or note the association of this with human habitation. And it was a remarkable thing which he did in many ways. And, and it informed the way that uh, developer archaeology developed in Sweden. Um, it was very usual to sort of plot phosphorus concentrations across large tracts of land and really to use that information to establish uh, future development zones. Um, then by the 1970s, very much in the sort of guise of new archaeology, we start to see phosphate analysis uh, being reviewed. Now, I've just put up here some of the work from those very early studies of Arrhenius, and you can see... Um, He's already sort of plotting this out spatially and noting concentrations of phosphorus and how that sort of maps to evidence for human habitation. In addition to the spatial dimension of geochemistry, which is really quite unusual, he also uh, looks at vertical profiling of geochemistry. And it's, it's interesting, at the end of Arenas' early papers, he notes that geochemistry can be very cheap and uh, very quick to undertake. Now, he was, of course, using a, um, a titration or a wet-based chemistry method to do his phosphorus uh, analysis. And it was really by the sort of post-war years that we start to see a shift away from wet chemistry to instrumental chemistry. And in many ways, that has the effect of sort of increasing costs and slowing down the number of samples 
which we can reasonably take um, for a laboratory-based analysis. And in many ways, it was this slowing down and increase in costs of geochemistry, which uh, I think um, it was Andy earlier on in the first paper who said, you know, if resistivity is the poor cousin of magnetometry, then, you know, geochemistry is really down and out in archaeology. It's very rarely used. And it is because it's slow uh, and it is expensive. And because of that, we've been really um, hamstrung by a method which is dependent on low sample numbers. Um, there are exceptions, Arrhenius in the very early work being one, uh, but also the AML, certainly where my own interests in soil chemistry began. Uh, back in 1980, this is uh, Bartlett's work here, again, uh, laboratory-based, but he's using MagSus, interestingly, alongside uh, geochemical analysis to look at the spatial variation within Conebury um, Henge. Um, great study, but again, the fact it was done by the AML, it wasn't routinely rolled out. Um, is a sort of uh, indication of the slowness and the expense associated with this method. So the way archaeologists have tended to employ geochemistry because of this slowness and expense is rather than taking frequent samples over a, a, a whole area, there's been much more to sort of take individual samples of interesting areas and then compare this to sort of background levels. And as recently as 2004, there's a very good paper by Haslam and Tibbet, um, where they actually try to understand how they can better reduce the number of samples taken off a site to characterize it, simply because of the problems associated with cost and with the length of um, the analysis it takes itself. Now, what really I'm here to sort of uh, talk about today in many ways is some of the innovations which have happened in analytical techniques, uh, particularly portable XRF, and how that really changes the way we can start to deploy geochemistry um, in a sort of uh, professional commercial context. So the in situ approach um, using portable analytical equipment gets us out of the lab, it gets us into the field, and it has the sort of advantages of being economically viable, it's rapid, but there's a real focus on the spatial variability Ability to start to identify activity areas. And in that way, it's in much more parallel, a uh, much more parallel method to geophysics. And what, what we advocate, certainly at ARS, is that the, um, by taking thousands of samples, we can start to identify signatures of practice revealed through that variability. Now, this varies very much from when you just take a handful of samples. Uh, in this approach, we're taking many samples over an area, it's varying resolutions, and then we're using the, that spatial variation in geochemistry to start to plot um, that variability across space and to look at the types of spatial signatures which are given by that geochemical variation. And it's an interesting um, one when we start to look at what soil variation, um, you know, what is it really indicating? Well. One thing which I've certainly found since working with soils is that uh, no one um, type of soil scientist tends to agree on what soil is, whether it's a, a mineral, whether it's biological, whether it's a, a complex, solid, fluid um, cocktail, or whether it is, in fact, even a cultural material. And I think the answer really is it's, it's a bit of everything. Uh, and it makes it a very complicated um, material to start to think about analysing and critically understanding the processes which underpin its alteration. So too often, I think, you know, we, we overlook soil. It's the most common material we find on any archaeological site. Um, and when we do so, we tend to conceptualise it as some sort of natural background material. But it is certainly an anthropogenic or cultural material. And I, I would always advocate it has this sort of dual inheritance of both being natural and cultural. In terms of seeing soils as something which we have input energy and effort into through fertilizing agricultural soils or you know, sort of middening and things like that, it's probably the largest investment that humanity as a species has ever made in terms of where it's directed its energies. And uh, I would say we overlook this uh, inheritance of our soils as a, a great peril. Um, Early on, in terms of understanding how we imprint or alter soils, it's been noted uh, by many soil scientists, asking particularly that uh, activities such as just dwelling in the environment, when humans dwell in a place, um, habitation, if you want, we tend to 
take elements from the wider environment through a variety of uh, processes, particularly metabolic processes, we tend to concentrate certain elements in certain areas. And because those practices are all cultural, the uh, signatures that we tend to leave behind are also indicative of certain types of cultural habits. So human habitation, stored animals, fires, hearths, craft working, um, all being noted to add significantly to um, the soils in any particular local environment. Um, the critical point which I'd like to underpin today in our approach to soil chemistry is very much that we're looking at a spatial chemistry. It's not simply just taking the odd um, sample and comparing that to a, a nominal background and saying this is enhanced. It's more about looking at the patterns and the form of that geochemical variation. So what we're really looking at in this enhancement is uh, routines of practice, how routine cultural practices start to imprint on the soil. And I've always found it very useful to think of, if we think of geophysics as being useful for identifying architecture and archaeological features, ge geochemistry is very uh, complementary in many ways in that it uh, identifies uh, activity spaces and uh, evidence of inhabitation itself. And you can see there in the bottom corner, um, the fort of uh, Bruff Navio in the, uh, in the Peak District, a very nicely defined signature there showing how that and the, the fort and the associated vicars manifest themselves geochemically. So what's made this possible? It's um, very much the innovation in portal instrumentation. It allows us to gather 30 independent elements rapidly. Uh, it allows high resolution map mapping and it, it allows us to sort of get in and prospect in areas where geophysics, for instance, because of vegetation cover and things like that, simply um, wouldn't be allowed. There's always been concern about the correlation between in situ chemical data and um, laboratory based data. There's a nice little test case there looking at phosphorus, a very challenging element, comparing um, it's a late Bronze Age roundhouse internal uh, structure. And you can see there the PXRF compared to the lab based approach. And from an interpretive perspective, and indeed from a, a hard analytical perspective, the data sets are very comparable. Um, one thing which, um, through really the support of Jay and HS2, which we've been allowed to sort of develop is the commercial application of these techniques, having you know, sort of really had them restrained to the university environments for the last two decades. Um, and one of the things, one of the first things we were keen to explore was the correlation with geophysics, but also critically, whether we needed to take a sort of a cord sample, which again takes a lot longer, takes a lot of time, or whether we could just work on the actual topsoil itself. And um, one of the things which we've shown, the results are certainly comparable. In the central image there, you can see how our geochemical um, anomalies correlate with the geophysics, uh, but also the topsoil and the cord samples are certainly comparable, at least from an interpretive perspective. And this is really because of processes like biotic cycling, where um, nutrients from deep down in the soil are sort of cycled up to the surface and redeposited there. So uh, it's a very convenient thing for the geochemist who's using that chemical data to prospect for archaeology. Um, so one of the things, just to reiterate there, we can now very easily undertake high resolution mapping where we can take thousands of samples rather than single samples. And we're not reliant just on a single element, but we can actually gather data for up to 34 independent chemical elements. And an important point is this is completely independent from geophysics. So when used as a complementary technique, it really adds something to the archaeological, uh, the archaeologist's armor, uh, armory rather, in terms of finding an independent test for the presence or indeed absence of um, archaeology. Um, and this is one thing really, which we came to um, work with Fusion JV at uh, HS2, and it was used in the blank area testing program, which Jay re uh, referred to earlier. It was very much an independent test for the presence of archaeological de deposits. And it also, we sort of challenged it to sort of test for the presence of hard to find archeology. span Well, what we mean by that is really sort of pre-Iron Age, if you want. So uh, uh, Bronze Age, Neolithic and earlier archeology. span um, we worked over a, a tract of HS2, 31 different sites over an area of about 30 
kilometers, a total of 200 hectares. And um, it allowed us over a, a sort of a period of about five months to undertake 6,000 analyses, uh, rapid reporting between 24 hours and up to five working days. And critically for the HS2 work, we combined it with targeted test pitting. And that this proved very critical um, in the hard to find archeology span itself. I'll uh, skip on because I'm conscious of time. This is uh, some of our results. It's a uh, field which is currently undergoing mitigation at the moment. Um, we often sort of celebrate uh, to some degree the hard to find archeology, span but I think the most important contribution in many ways which the geochemistry has made is looking at the overall variance in geochemical variability across the uh, blank area testing area and actually confirming independently um, the absence of any significant anomalies which could be thought to be archaeological. Um, we always do geochemistry in hand with uh, magnetic susceptibility and there's a very good reason for that which I won't digress into now but we find it a very uh, useful uh, technique which adds no cost or time really to the standard geochemical test itself. Um, what you can see here is field 70, um, a very strong anomaly up here in the north of the field. Sorry? Okay, well, I'm one minute away from finishing. Um, and through combining that with test pits, what it actually allows us to identify is the high concentrations of lithics in this case, uh, but also to test the sort of anomalies where we get sort of a less structured anomaly and um, where we tend not to see a, a high return in lithics. So the, it's the combination of geochemistry with test pitting, which will, really allowed us to sort of move forward with the um, blank area testing. Um, that was reported rapidly, leads to a discussion with the client on how to take that forward. And just to show you some of the results we've been getting there from uh, one of the fields on HS2 is a significant number of um, Lithics remains uh, from early Mesolithic uh, through, through to late Upper Paleolithic, and these sites are undergoing um, mitigation at the moment, based upon the combination of geochemical prospection with uh, test pitting. Um, and this, this has really allowed us to sort of put together a, what we call our landscape prospection service, where um, we've started to sort of look really at the combination, uh, having invested in drone-based technology, combining what people have been talking about earlier in the session of multispectral LIDAR and deposit modelling, really, to look at how all these data sets can come together and really give us a great sort of uh, much richer um, perspective on these um, um, landscapes. So in conclusion, um, the innovation in the deployment of uh, novel analytical equipment has allowed true spatial chemistry to now be part of professional commercial practice. An ability to detect archaeological deposits acts as an independent means of determining blank areas. And it really has significant implications for thinking about what these geochemical signatures are at the landscape um, scale. And it certainly provides alternatives now to the existing evaluation pathways and the sole dependency on geophysics and evaluation trenching, which archaeology in the professional sector often has to rely on. And with that, I'll conclude. So thank you very much for your time.